Um, when I got the um, information through from, from yourself, it said my talk was going to be entitled What is Packaging Design? And I thought, for heaven's sake, at the end of the day, the last thing you want to do is hear someone talk about what is packaging design. And anyway, you can go and read, buy my bloody book. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought uh, I'd just share with you some of the things that I kind of think are important in the context of food packaging. Some of the things that I love. Some of these are projects that I just kind of go, oh, I wish I'd done that. Uh, it's not. It's not particularly logical. It may be slightly chaotic. But let's see how. It goes. Um, I was very conscious, uh, having though, that having spoken to some of you, I'm probably, this is probably wrong, but I was very conscious that, that some some of you've got brands that are little acorns that you want to grow into big oak trees, and some of you've got brands that are like bonsai trees. You want to keep them small and perfect. But I think the rules that we're talking about apply to both of you. Some of the, those people who've got a brand and they just want to keep it, and they want to keep it this perfect little thing, and they want to build it slowly. These rules apply, or these things apply equally to those people. And a lot of you are very ambitious to get into the retailers, get into Tesco's, get into all these people, build a huge brand. So. The other thing I um, will constantly come across um, are statistics relating to packaging. <coughs> They're all over the place. Uh, these two, I think, are very um, interesting. 70% um, of purchase decisions are made in store. Um, so, for, for the packaging designer's point of view, I'm um, big, big flag in the air saying that packaging is incredibly important. There's a very famous book written in the 60s by a guy called James Pilditch called The Silent Salesman, and he was talking about packaging. I think the other statistic that is really very really interesting is 10% of the shoppers switch brands in store. If you turn that round, it means that 90% of the shoppers are in store, aren't prepared to switch brands or go in with a mindset that they want to buy something, they know what they want to buy, they're going to buy it and they're going to get out the store. So for you who've got new brands, the challenge is incredibly large because you've kind of got to say to those consumers, hey, I'm out here. Now I'm going to tell you what I'm all about, and now I want you to buy the product. So it's a huge challenge, and uh, you know, when, whenever we sit down with a client, we kind of have that in the back of the mind. I was very conscious um, that we were talking about yourselves, local food producers, and one of the issues that's coming up with the people I've spoken to um, is this whole issue of provenance. You know, how do you communicate provenance on pack? And these are some of, some of these things are... are you, know, you could say there's a you know, the typical route is you go down a photographic route, or you go down an illustrative route. And all of these, these things work to say to people, this is where the product comes from, this is where it's rooted. Uh, and I just think these packs are very successful, but some of the packs that I quite like are these two, for example. Well, I think the designer has kind of added their own twist on it. They've brought something to the party. You know, this is a very, very simple pack that you get the taste of Spain in an instant. Very clean, it's very uncutted, you cut away everything and you just say to people, this product comes from a certain region and it just strikes you straight away. I think this one is equally interesting, you know, three Dutch farmers and they've kind of taken that and embraced it and made it something really, really interesting. And I think there are all sorts of things you can do like that with your produce, with your particular locality, you can, you know, you, you don't have to just stick the traditional imagery on it. I was fortunate enough to work with a guy who designed this packaging, a guy called Fernando Gutierrez, mad Spanish guy. He spends hours and hours and hours on design. I think these two are very good illustrations of, you know, this is, the illustration tells you this comes from France, tells you it comes from Italy, and it all does it in a quite, quite a detailed way. But the packaging on the right is possibly one of my favourite bits of packaging because that simple addition of the horn on the G tells you exactly where this comes from. And it just communicates to you straight away. It's kind of like when you drive around Spain, you know, the famous pools on the hillsides. They're all positioned on the hillsides, aren't they? Because when the sun goes down, all you get is that beautiful silhouette. And I think that, to me, works in the same way. You don't need to be told, this is Spain with all the Spanish images. You just, you just look at it and go, that's it. It really go, goes to the heart of it. Um, you asked the question about shape, and I think 
um, I'm very conscious that we have lots of conversations with people who are starting out and don't have huge budgets. But to, to me, shape is possibly one of the biggest things <coughs> that you can use to differentiate your brand. Um, I'm always very intrigued that um, one of the most famous brands in the world, Jack Daniels, Square Bottle, in 18, I don't know whatever it was, 1890, when, when the guy who founded Jack Daniels, he chose the Square Bottle to differentiate himself from all the other whiskey brands. And somewhat, 150 or how many years later, we're still talking to clients about the same thing, about using shape to differentiate. And this is another bottle, I think, where, you know, you look at that bottle and it takes you to Greece. It immediately communicates just through shape alone. You're in a territory where you kind of have all sorts of associations. And a lot of the time, my job is just to create associations in people's minds. And I think, you know, there's a quality to that huge quality to it and it's very simple. It's a two-colour job. <coughs> Not a lot of you know expense is going to go into reproduction because it's a very simple job. This one I love. I just, just love this because at the end of the day, you know, packaging has a primary function which is to deliver the goods to you in a safe condition. It's, it has a secondary function which is to you know go from the factory to the door. It has another function which is to, you know, hold the product but you know other other roles are has, has a secondary role you know in this age of disposability and everyone talks about recycling and all that i look at this part and i go who would throw that away <laughs> who would dare, dare to throw that away and you sit on your table and you could see someone going i'm going to keep that on my table so you've got a constant reminder of that bad right now clearly there's an expense involved in this but if you've got a gradation of products, you maybe use this for your hero brand. Because the, 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 the noise you can generate around your hero brand from that sort of packaging. So I just what, think it's lovely. What is that actually? It's wood. This is wood. It's wood. It's made of wood, it's got a cork top stuff a hair and a rope handle product. What's it? It's honey. Product? It's honey. What do you mean by hero brand? Well for example, you know, some products you may charge a premium for. So in that particular case, you may say, because we can charge a premium for it, we can, we can claw back the cost of the packaging through using this sort of packaging on that hero, and then it, it cascades down through the range. <clears throat> so if you've got gradations of product from a really expensive product to a low one, you wouldn't use it on a low one, but you may use it on the high one, and in certain retail environments, that will get a lot of noise. And in the age of social media, people will start talking about, oh, I've just bought this fabulous piece of packaging. Have you seen it? Oh, you must get it. So when Coca-Cola do limited ranges where they use Matthew Williamson, they know people are going to start talking about it and collect them. I'm a packaging nerd, I admit it. <laughs> when I go around stores, my partner, she gets fed up because, you know, I'm not there to shop, I'm there to look, you know. I'm there to find something new. <laughs> another, another product where I think, you know, where shape, and it's interesting, a lot of people go, well, we can't do this because we, we, um, we don't have the budget. And our, uh, some ex-colleagues of mine worked on the Waitrose essential oils years and years ago. Uh, and they, they, they didn't want to put it in a traditional olive oil bottle. And in that fact, what they found was the Johnny Walker Square bottle, a whiskey bottle. And they put it in that. And that simple exercise of just thinking left field, going, we'll go, we'll go and find a stock bottle but we use it in, our, in a different environment. You can, use diff you can choose, get differentiation through that. I like this bottle because it's another instance, I think, where you, know, you put that on your table and you keep it on your table because it's just so essentially beautiful. But it's also very, it's kind of very confident. And I think a lot of brands kind of think they have to throw everything at, the bar, you know, everything at it to make, to make the statement, where sometimes less is more. Um, brand personality, I mean, it's come up, it's come up time and time again in the conversations we've been having. I think it's becoming increasingly important that brands have a personality because um, in certain instances, I was talking to someone earlier about yogurts, you know, in yogurts, it, it's a commodity. Um, and, and in some cases, you can add to that commodity by the way you produce it in small batches, in Added, added components, but a lot of the time, what will differentiate you as a brand is your personality. 
So if you, you goo, for example, it's, you know, you just look at that and it's all about brand personality. And these are two interesting, you know, this is Adams and Harlow, you know, whether Adams and Harlow ever existed, I don't know. But, you know, straight away you've got, you know, these two characters, a bit like the old Bradford and Bingley characters, a bit like, I'm conscious now, I'm talking about very English things, but... <laughs> <laughs> more come on wise, more come on wise. <laughs> um, you know, and then this is, you know, this, this whole pack is all about um, communicating a certain attitude through personality. So you straight away, you understand what you're dealing with is, is you, this may be a commodity or maybe you may be able to buy it somewhere else, but what you're, what you're associating with or what you're communicating with is, is something that you kind of attune to. And this, for example, I think is really interesting. These are bloody olives. <laughs> These are olives. I mean, but they've done something. They've packaged them. They've turned them into olives. They put them in a very distinctive piece of packaging. And then if you read the thing down here, this is all about, the, the, the pack copy is all about, I've got bloody awful eyesight, so I can't read it, but uh, a single mature olive looking for the like-minded individuals. They've understood that, you know, they've developed a tone of voice. But other people have talked about it. It's about tone of voice. It's about developing a personality. It's about creating a relationship with people. It's about saying, you know, we're not so serious about olives. We love our olives, and we, we want you to love our olives. So if you're like-minded, let's, let's get together. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Trotters found this in Suffrages the other day, essentially English. You know, God, it's only um, poor scratchings, not, not, not my idea, but you know, there's a character coming through here. And this one here, I thought, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I was interested in, in your, your talk, you know, the, you know there's, a, there's a, something coming through, a real personality coming through in that, you know. This is in your face stuff. If you go onto the beautiful images and look at Surrender the Booty, the way they promote themselves. You know, lots of women in tight t-shirts and uh, yo-ho-hos and things like that, but straight away it's coming through. And it's quite clever as well because it references sort of things that we used to, you know, anyone who's watched Pirates of the Caribbean immediately starts to associate, you know, what's his name, um, Jeffrey Rush, you know, when the moon goes down or goes up, I can't remember which one it is, you know, and it, you know, so they're using, they're playing on association. But straight away, you now this is just a pepper hot sauce, but it's not a hair pepper hot sauce, it's a pepper hot sauce with attitude. <laughs> Straight away. And, but you can do it more simply. I mean, this is very simple, you know, talking about Eric Gill and about typography. You know, this is molasses, this is sugar. But this is, um, you know, this is a brand that's created their own personality through, you know, just very, very illustrative, decorative type. And each, each, each type of sugar has been given its own typography. And it's, it's lovely, it's, it's got a got a maturity about it. This brand I, I, I discovered recently, I just think it's great. I mean, you know, these, these, this is a brand that has been founded by our husband and wife team. You know, they've created this character, Thomas J. Fudge, you know, mar remarkable bakery. And they just created this wild and wacky illustrative style. But when you see it on shelf, you go straight to it because it just kind of intrigues you. And the product is very different, you know, you buy these crackers and they're black and you think, why do I want to have a black cracker? But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all an agreeable, wholesome platform for food. Uh, food for, oh, I can't read it. Anyway. You can understand, you know, it's got a language of its all and they've created this character. The character's got nothing to do with the people who founded it. If you meet them, their husband wife did but you know, they're not Thomas J. Fudge, but they've created this character. And it's all about personality. It's about taking a brand and saying, let's create something that people can relate to. And this one I thought was really funny. Believe it or not, Duchess and Rover, gourmet sausages for dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever next. Whatever next. <laughs> but it's lovely, though. I mean, they, you know, it even goes to the crest. So the, the language has been carried all the way through. Repeatedly approved by Duchess and Rover for bears and delectable doggy delights. <laughs> I thought this was a, I thought it was a joke, but then I, we, we, um, one of the directors has got a dog that she brings into the studio every day, and I showed this to her, and she said, "Oh yeah, I know all about those. We bought some the other day." Said, You're mad. <laughs> <laughs> Sausages with dogs. 
Um, I, the other thing I think we some, sometimes it's worth remembering is um, the purchaser and the consumer. And these two, just to illustrate, yeah, I, you know, the, um, it's this whole notion that you know, we buy produce for our kids, we buy food for our kids. Um, it's just that, that thing called pester power. You know, you're in the supermarket and you're with your kids and they decide that's the produce. I want the one with the big teeth and that's the only one. So sometimes when you're, you know, you're creating packaging, yes, you meet the client and the client is lovely grown up and you, they say, oh, we're designing the, aiming this for families. But at the end of the day, the person you're really designing it for is the end, the consumer, the end consumer who's a kid. You know, obviously there are all sorts of moral ethics about promoting <laughs> things to kids, but you can design things in a way where the kid will go, ah, oh, it's brilliant, I want to, oh, you know, that's my ice cream, that's what I want. <laughs> and you can understand, that's what someone's, someone's thought through the process and say, this is what we're trying to do. Zigging when others are zagging. Uh, I mean, I think, think this often applies when you're in a really crowded marketplace. These two are, this one I particularly like, you know, everyone knows crisps. Another, another English reference, you know, Walker's crisps, Gary Lineker, everywhere. You know, you see Walker's crisps, Miss Chris, you know, you see all the big brands, and then someone comes into the marketplace with a crisp, which then they, um, they're undeniable about it. It's, these are crisps for snobs. <laughs> and, and all the, the illustrations are beautiful, beautiful illustrations, and they all have these wonderful characters on them. And they've recognised that they cannot go up against the big boys. You don't have the spending power to generate an advertising campaign. You simply cannot spend the money they do. But what you can do at the point of sale is create something that will stop people in their tracks and go, what is that? And at that point, people will go, oh, well, that looks rather interesting. And that's the process you're trying to go through. You know, if you go back to that 10%, that is the process that you're trying to achieve. You know, Adnan's are a beer. Beer manufacturers, they, they produce beers, wonderful beers in Suffolk. They get you drunk very, very quickly. <laughs> but they've branched out, and I think what's very interesting is that you know, in branching out, they've recognised that they, you know, they don't have the heritage of some of these, you know, Glyphidic or Johnny Walker or Lafrague, they don't have that heritage. So they can't emulate what they do. They don't have that long 200-year history to call upon. So let's create whiskey packaging that has its own, has our footprint. So our handwriting on it, and in its own way, it has a, it has a stature, it has a quality. And it, for those, for certain consumers, they'll go, yes, I'll, I'll try that. <coughs> but they haven't tried to be a me too. This brand I love. I don't know if you've come across it. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a range of chocolates called Bloomsbury, and this is another instance where someone is it rather than sad. This is my favourite, this is my favourite, this is called the Marital Bliss Bar. 50% is his, 50% is her. <laughs> and it's lovely, they, they, there's about 30 of these. This one here, yeah, Girth Can Trust, good, good subject. It's a fair aisle. Uh, we're all pleasure. But, I mean, they, these are great. And this is one of the cases where I've gone round with my partner and bought these. And she said, oh, great, I'll enjoy those tonight. I said, you're not going to bloody eat them. They're going into my archive. And I have a collection of all these things. If you actually open them, the chocolate has probably gone white by now. <laughs> I just think it's great. But someone has said, we cannot, com we cannot compete with Cadbury's. If I said Cadbury's to you now, you probably all think that lovely rich purple. And it, the... Years and years of association, you can't compete with that. But I dare you to stop in the aisle and look at that and not smile and go, I'm going to buy it as a joke, perhaps, but then you'll take it home and you'll eat it and you'll go, oh, I love that. And, all, and then you'll see the next one. You go, you know, I've given these to all sorts of different people. <laughs> <laughs> but by, by contrast, this is um, another range of chocolates. And I think these are quite interesting because, um, likewise, they've kind of gone, let's have an attitude. And this is, this is, this is kind of like, you know, this is, the, the emphasis here is on, you know, the, the actual chocolate, the percentage. So they're competing with green and blacks. They're competing with divine chocolate. 
but there's a sort of real attitude to it. I mean, this is kind of taking chocolate into a fashion area. It's kind of making a almost a sort of aesthetic, artistic thing. But, you know, they're also communicating where the, the chocolate comes from. So this is probably hardcore chocolate people. But it, once again, they're not trying to compete with Cadbury's. They're kind of saying, <coughs> let's do it in our own terms. Let's try and build share. And you can see certain, certain retailers would go, I love this. You know, this is, this is for us. And what's in the name? It's interesting, I was listening to the conversation about the trouble brewing and what, 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 they, you know, what they were going to call it. I just think these are great. You know, brewing New York is, you know, just tipped off the tongue and it's just kind of great. But equally, I, this is an old brand, but I still think it stands the test of time. Talking about chili sauces and Dante's Inferno. I mean, what a great name <laughs> for a chili sauce! It's just because it, straight away you've gone, gone there, haven't you? You've gone, and and you know, one that once again is one of those ones you kind of collect and just go. And I think names, you know, scoffs to me is perfect name because it just short sharp, but it kind of sums up. It sums up that sort of. You're trying to appeal to people's hearts and minds. It kind of appeals to your heart and have a good scarf. I think, you know, people don't spend enough time on names. And the names are just as important in differentiating you. So, this, you know, Goo, when it was launched, I remember reading the, the, the designer saying, you know, the client came in and he said, look, I'm really sorry, but we found this um, Scandinavian dessert manufacturer. And they've got this really wacky name called Goo. And the client went, oh, that's brilliant. I wish, I wish I could have that. And that's when they did the reveal. And they said, well, actually, it's the brand we've created for you. <laughs> <laughs> goo. I mean, think about it, goo. And the advertising they did, you know, which is the tagline is irresistible. The advertising they did, I don't know if, didn't, I don't know if you had it here, but it was irresistible moments. So it's like someone walking up a stair behind a guy in a kilt. <laughs> it, was, it was bubble wrap. It was bubble wrap, and it was all those moments where you cannot resist. <laughs> and it was great. It was like someone with a collar turned up. It was all those things, and it, it just all see. And there, it's, there's, but it all comes back to that notion, of goo. I mean, who calls a product goo? <laughs> but it's great. Isn't it? The other thing I think um, people kind of least. The, the really good people think about is imagery, the sort of imagery that you should include. You know, these, these, you know, these are clearly are, uh, this isn't packaging, but it's, it's someone saying, right, how do, we, how do we create an image style that we can own? Because in, 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 in terms of differentiation, the more, the more elements you've got that you can use to differentiate you. So if you create an image style, so goo, going back to goo, have a style of photography now which accentuates the gooiness of their products and they just look sumptuous. So anyone coming to the marketplace, trying to enter marketplace, <coughs> doing something similar is always going to be compared to them. So you have to step, step aside. And I think these are just really interesting ideas. This one I particularly like, which is you know, it's a piece of cucumber, but it's a, you know, a book cup. And there's ways of taking your products and saying, how do we do this? How do we take our products, or how do we take where they come from, and how do we create a style that is ownable, that, that is ours? Um, and then you, you know, you can, so this is a good illustration. You know, someone's just taken, a, you know, licorice and just created an illustrative style that is own, it's ownable by them. And this is, you know, this is a famous campaign done by Lavazza, you know. Coffee, 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 you know, there's, there are lots of coffee brands out here, but they took the view, let's, let's create a, an advertising campaign in this case, but it reflects back on the brand in terms of you know, where it's just, they know their audience, you know, Lavazza is that sort of Italian, modern aesthetic, and they chose a style to reflect that. Not everyone has this opportunity but shelf impact, you know, one of the things designers are always talking about, I think it came up in your, in your first talk, which is how do you achieve shelf impact? Because um, I think you know, the statistic is that most consumers give an average pack two seconds. The only, the only packaging I know that is given a long-term consideration is suntan um, packaging. 
and worked on my work for Boots uh, on the Salt Town brand. And I think the average the average person spends about 25 to 30 minutes looking at salt, uh, <laughs> at, at Sun Town packaging, studying it, reading it. <laughs> Because if you're going to get burnt, and I got burnt recently uh, on, on holiday, I went lobster, as my two sons always say. Dad, you've turned into a lobster. Um, you know, it's important, but you know, most consumers give packaging very, very little, so you really have to have cut through. And I think this is a very good illustration. And then if you take a product like, um, take a product like cheeses, you know, the cheese counter, lots and lots of cheeses, lots of products. We, talk, we were talking earlier about. Is how, do you, how do you achieve distinctiveness for your brand? You know, and I think it's just a very, a very, to me, a very beautiful device because they've taken the window, the, the window into the cheese packet, and created a device that is ownable and that can extend all the way through. So as you see, their cheeses are in the different sections. It's created, created a certain distinctiveness about it. Waitrose, um, they they refer to it as their handwriting which I think is a really, really interesting way of thinking about your brand. Do, do you have a handwriting that is yours? You know, arguably Trouble Brook, they've got a handwriting. You kind of look at the label and go, if you, put your, if you put your hand over the logo and look at the label, you'd probably go, I think I know where that comes from. <laughs> you know, there's a handwriting about it. And I think, you know, especially when you're starting to, you know, especially when you're starting to develop retail brands, big brands, Creating a handwriting, you know, and Waitrose handwriting is very simple. They pair it right back, pair it right back. But the idea, there's an immediacy to the idea. And I thought the strength of the, um, you know, the brand that's going for the honey, the Katu honey, you know, that, that device, that lovely device with the, the I just thought you know, it has that simplicity of idea. You know straight away what that's all about. Cut through it straight away. Yeah. None, another honey packaging. I, I, the, to me, it's another illustration where I just think you're just working off people's associations. You're making them do the work. You're not having to tell them this is honey. You're not having to tell them how good it is. Because straight away you look at that and go, well, what is it? It's a bee. You know, you can do all of that in here. But this is, a, to me, another pack that, you know, you put that on your table, you keep it on your table. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful. And it says something about you, and it says, I'm not using all the atypical imagery that everyone else is using. I'm going to stand out. And it's done it very simply. Very simply. Telling a story. A lot of people talked about what is the brand story. This is, a, I think, a very interesting... Um, this was done by Carter Wong, a small agency in London. They've been going for years and years and years. It's really, very good. I think it's, you know, this is, um, you know, we're in fair trade. There's a certain set of imagery that was built up with it, fair trade, where, you know, you, you, show, you show the, you know, you show the farmers, you show the, the people producing the, 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 the raw produce. In this case, what they've actually done is they're telling the story through the implements that these people use. And it kind of takes you into that, their world, you know, the secretary that these people use, you know, to, to, trim, to trim the plants and to tend, you know, it's taking you in right into their world. I think it's a really interesting way of doing it. Alternatively, you, you know, you can, do it, you can do it with a sort of very simple, almost retro look, you know, but there are different things going on, you know, from small tea gardens, deliciously fresh black tea, you know, there's all sorts of stories and it's really nicely done in a very different way. Or you do it, you know, with all sorts of the layering of messages. There's obviously, you're probably told by now that certain things that I find fairly important talk a lot about. But, you know, I think, you know, this is a visual story that I think is done really well. You kind of get drawn into the product, you know, don't, you know what is the product, what's made from, and you kind of feel there's a certain, there's an order to it, there's a quality to it. It's lovely. Well, this one, you know, there's all sorts of things going on, but, you know, packaging and healthy hearts, so there's, you know, going back to your patio story, there's lots and lots of things, and I think you can, you can bring them to the party. Whereas this, this one, you know, I think this is, um, you know, built from apples, I kind of like that approach, you know. So instead of saying it's made from apples, it's built from apples, and it's a smith and forge, you know, it kind of the language all relates, and it kind of, to me, all works. 
You know, what is hard cider? <laughs> I don't know, but it sounds like it's going to knock you flat on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great, isn't it? Hard cider. But it's telling their story, and their story is different from Dormers, and it's different from Magnus. But, uh, you know, and that, you look at that and you go, well, that's a different proposition to, to Magnus. Sometimes you can get it bloody wrong, and this one, right, to me, is just the most extraordinary. And I've put this on because it's an example. Patastus Bravus is also a gauntlet or guard thrown down at the feet of our competition, competitors, challenging them to use hunting. Oh, it just goes on and on and on. You kind of think someone's got the wrong end of the stick here. Which is great. It's only that this is going to go, everyone's going to go, oh, God. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I thought your, the scoff, the other thing that's lovely about scoff is the, the internal reveal. And I think sometimes, you know, you're talking about the, the, um, the fudge as well, and things like that. Sometimes it's just that lovely little reveal and the use of colour. And the use of that reveal can say a lot about it. And, you know, this is a very simple piece of packaging. Come back to looking at yourself there, you know, with your packaging. You know, sometimes, you know, this is a, you know, a very simple craft board almost. But what the reveal says does something different, and I think that's really nice. Just as these are, you know, these these are sausages. If someone's kind of got got the idea. Well, let's how do how do we you know how do we do something? How do we how are we different? So they you know put this wonderful panoply of colours, and it does say something. You know, sitting in sitting in the retailer's cooler cabinet, sitting there, you're going to kind of go. What, what, what is that? And I think it's really, really nice. This comes down to descriptive power. You know, this is maple syrup. It's, it's, uh, it's early as the arms of a lumberjack. <laughs> really nice, you kind of... Uh, and everyone's talked about getting a copywriter on board. I, and I think it's, a, it's very wise, because, you know, the, the, you know, what you have to do in packaging is so immediate, but sometimes... It's just those little words that really add the, the dimension. I thought I put these two in because I think they're, they're very interesting. You know, goes, this goes back to this notion of can you can you do things with your brand that would differentiate you? This is actually these believe are are, 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 are oils, chili oils. Ah, but someone someone's kind of gone left field and gone oils. Oh, <coughs> and they just you know chosen you. Know, Oh, Kelly, once again, you're back in this thing about t hero, hero territory. <coughs> but I think there's a really nice attitude to it, and someone's kind of gone, how do we, what do we do, what can we do? But so just, as, just as easily, this, this product, <coughs> there's extraordinary confidence about that. Just, you know, just the jam, it's the jam, jam, nothing but the jam, I think it's lovely. This one, to me, uh, is one of the ones I want to keep... I don't know how I don't know how you arrived at that, and that's where you kind of go. What, where, what, what, how does the creative brain work that looks at a carton and goes Batman's ears? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great, isn't it? <laughs> and personally, if I saw that in a chiller cabinet, I'd want to pick it up and look at it. It's just great. It's simple, and it and it, you know, it's it's a, a milk cocktail. Strawberry milk cocktail. So where did someone go? How did someone go from <laughs> milk cocktail to Batman to ears to that? <laughs> but equally, that has you know so much consumer appeal. Sometimes you can do things very simply, and I, I put this one in just simply because you can go completely the other way. You, this this calls for extraordinary confidence on the part of a brand, but you know, this is just a standard. Stand the jack, <coughs> the, uh, an aluminium cap, and they put a, it's almost like a wood sleeve. Very simple statement. Works for some products, doesn't work for all products, but you know, if you've got a high value, really, really top, top of the brand, and you're trying to sell into the high end consumers like Selfridges and Harvey Nicks or, you know, or Fortnum Masons or all the top delis and places like that, you know, you know certain consumers are going to go for that and go, I'll buy that because of its simplicity. It's Graphic simplicity because the statement is quite quite restrained. I put these two in. Um, talking to someone about milk earlier. <laughs> I think it's very it's very interesting when you come on to food back food and taste projection. You know, this is what you know, this communicates taste in a very direct way. You know what's in it. It uses very very 
vibrant imagery and you kind of, it, it, it exudes taste, exudes flavour. I look at this and maybe this is just me, but for the same reason that packaging works for me because it, it works on associations. <coughs> that, that, that notion that when a drop, a drop of milk, drop of liquid just bouncing does something. Now maybe it does it to me, so maybe you're looking and going, the man's mad, no <laughs> taste protection in there at all. But I just think some, something to do with that drop and that, <coughs> like that, and it makes trigger something in your brain which is fresh milk, lovely, tasty, fresh milk. <coughs> this was shown earlier, so I, I, but it's it's probably worth remembering that you know, what we now take for granted in the way of Dorset cereals, when they launched what five six years ago, they completely zagged when everyone else was zigging. They, you know, they, they, they introduced this solid colour, they introduced the, the cut-out window, they introduced the gold foiling, they introduced all sorts of things now, which, as designers, when we're given a brief, very often we're given this and we said, do you remember Dorset cereals? We can't like what they did. And you kind of go, oh, here we go again. It's a bit like Apple, you know. We want to do an Apple. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, I think, you know, it, just an illustration of how... how um, Product display, going back to the, some of the other things, is vitally important. And then I'll, um, I don't know how we do with time, probably, a run, but I'll end on a couple of things. One of the things, as independent food producers, you have up your sleeve is the quality of your product. Um, and I'll close these two. Um, well, I had a debate with people in, in the studio about this one, because I was in Selfridges and I saw this. To me, when I look at that, I, I associate it with a fragrance brand, a perfume brand. I think Chanel Number no. Five. Now I may be wrong. <laughs> Maybe barking up the wrong tree. Here. But I think there's a bit of this brand playing off Chanel Number no. Five to convey, through association, quality, quality cues. So for some people, it will trigger that association because of the use of the you number. Know, the but equally, I think. Uh, this is a brand uh, I, I deliberately didn't put any of our agent, my agency's work in. Thought I'll stick it at the end, and you can you'll accept it by then. But, uh, my, <laughs> my agency's been working with. Um, I say my agency, the agency I have worked for. Um, I've been working with um, Diageo for years and years and years, and, and they worked on the, the redesign of the Johnny Walker bottle. And this is a brand you know established in 1821. It's been going for hundreds and hundreds of years. So when you're working on a brand like this, you kind of realise that you're, you, you know, you're dealing with the crown jewels. But what what I think whiskey brands are particularly good at um, are in conveying quality, and they don't just do it through gold foil. They don't just do it through varnishes. But you know, one of the things, you know, the, the lettering, the hand lettering that was done on this. You know, the striding man, and um, this the, you can use monograms. I think there are all sorts of visual devices that you, you as people, because you're so intimately <coughs> associated with your brand, can bring to the heart that, that have their own. So, hallmarks and monograms and things like that say quality in a very direct way to consumers. And I was very interested years ago, this is my last slide, but. Very interesting years ago, I was listening to Radio 4, and it was um, about six years ago when they were talking about the price of oil, and it had gone up to something like $120 a barrel. It had gone right through the roof, and everyone was going, oh my God, the price of petrol. And the guy who was commenting on it said, um, it's probably worth bearing in mind that a, um, a barrel of Coca-Cola is worth more than a barrel of oil. But if you think about it, Coca-Cola is just sugar water. The value of it comes from the brand. At the end of the day, what we're paying for is the Coca-Cola brand, because it's just sugar water with various other things. And this is, a, I put this last in illustration. Um, this is a project that I worked on last year for a Scotch whiskey. Um, we used all sorts of devices, we created a monogram, came up with a name, used the deco edging, used an illustration of a castle in Scotland. All of it was to create 
uh, a certain authority as a whiskey. All of it was to convey um, the, a brand that had been around for some time. Um, but in actual fact, this is a brand that was um, produced under license for Tesco. This is a Tesco brand. It's not branded Tesco. It doesn't say finest or anything, but this is actually a Tesco brand. If you read the back label, there's a little address at the back which tells you that it's owned by Tesco. But they have used all of the tricks of the trade in packaging. They've done all the things that you can do as a brand using packaging to convey quality, authority, longevity, heritage. Is there, actually, an ethic, sorry, is there an ethical thing about that? Sorry, I, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. I pick it up, I buy it, I drink whiskey and a scot. <laughs> when I turned, if I if I'd had a couple of glasses and turned it red, some Tesco's on the back. Would I throw it at the wall and think, God, do you <laughs> Not if the product's good. <laughs> Not if the product's good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But are you? That infers that this is a fabulous product inside. So did you sample it beforehand? We had. We, we it was produced by Greenolds, which is very well respected. Yeah. But as a producer who is, you know, you design your own packaging, sometimes it, well, just use it because it's there, beef burgers. You know, there was a terrible amount of lying going on in packaging, a terrible lot of deceit, and it knocks all of us off the perch as producers. You know, and you start to think, well, do I just whittle it back to, this is a piece of fish, buy it if you want. <laughs> well, you could try it. Yeah. <laughs> you could try it. Honest approach. It might work. It might work. Then again, it might not. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I do. Next to me. Questions for Joe?